Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Whittling Time. My name is Karen Brown, and I'm here to present to you Carousel Creatures. Carousels have been around for a very, very long time. They don't know the exact date that they started, but they have found reliefs in caves and in museum pieces that date back to the 500 AD. Um, originally, they were a single basket, a small basket could suspended from a pole and then it was spun and so a child could ride in it. Uh, later it was found that it developed into a type of war game where they would ride on horses and with a spear or a sword would try to collect a ring off of a ribbon that was either tied from a branch or a limb of a tree or suspended between a, on a rope between two poles. And that became popular in Italy and then also used in Turkey and Arabia. Later, they became very fashionable as rides, as entertainment for the royals. The most elaborate ones were originally created in about 1622 by um, the French King the Louis the 14th, I think, and he um, made his carousel for his teenage mistress to impress her. Ooh. And from there, it became very popular for the wealthy to go to parties and things to be entertained um, and ride on the carousels. The baskets were suspended usually on a horizontal wheel and was either turned by a man or a mule. Um, the speed was not what they we use today because it wasn't mechanized like we have ours today. Even, if, even be, before the uh, uh, invention of the gas engines, they would use steam or horsepower to drive the carousels around. Um, but even at that slower speed, the centrifugal force would fling the baskets out and people would sometimes slip out. Hence the term flying horses. It's one of the names uh, along with gallopers, merry-go-rounds, and carousel horses is what, one of the many names that was given to the apparatus that we now know as, as a carousel or merry-go-round. Um, while Columbus was doing his thing coming over here to discover America, um, the French were going crazy with them. They were started making um, more elaborate pieces for the folks to ride on because they, everything wanted, they wanted new things and, and more elaborate and more decorative. And so as time go on, they started developing um, carvings that they could use in their carousels. And mostly it was horses to start out with. Um, <coughs> The US, first U.S. Uh, carousel was done in 1799 in Salem, Massachusetts. Um, it was just horses. And then later, um, the carousel carvers started to introduce zoo animals along with mythological creatures. So we had the bears and the tigers and the lions, and then we started getting into unicorns and sea monsters and things like that. And as they, and as they progressed, the carvers were given more freedom to do more elaborate pieces on that. Frederick Savage was the gentleman who is credited for inventing the apparatus that allows our horses now to go up and down and give that riding motion. And he was very instrumental in doing that. And that came about um, around 1860 to 1890. And that's when um, Gustav Denzel came to the United States from uh, Germany. And he is one of our leading carvers. The, Rabbit and the cat here on the table are both taken after Denzel's creations and his uh, work that he's done. Uh, he did some of the most elaborate animals that were done in the United States. Um, he's also one of my favorite carvers to, to look at his work. Uh, then we have other people who also played great roles in developing carving. Uh, Mueller the, um, was also, a, and brothers, the D.C. Mueller and Company, the Long family, and then um, E. Joy Morris was another carver. The interesting thing is that most of these guys started out as cabinet makers, and when they came to the United States, there was also an, already a plethora of other cabinet makers here, so they found their little niche in the world by carving animals to make for the carousel industry, and a lot of these companies worked 365 days a year and just kept carving and they would have somebody who was just doing the bodies and somebody who was just doing the heads. Um, I got this book, The History of the Carousels, at one of our wood carving events. I won it in the, in the freebie auction ticket. 
I read it and I've always loved carousels because I rode on them when I was a kid and had my favorite horse that I had to ride on every time I went. Uh, but it became very evident to me that um, I got a calling for it because of the lady's uh, father who carved the carousel horses for the Saginaw Zoo. He came, passed away, and she came to me and said, I have leftovers from his estate. Would you be interested in taking a look at him? And I said, sure. Um, she had a full-size horse that was in process. I have no place to put a full-size horse, but she had these little kits. And so I took the kits. I took every one of them she had, and I started out, and I did the rabbit first, and then I started the horses, and I just completed the cat, which was my last in the series. And this is a class that I'll be offering in June for the Everett uh, wood carving event. So if you would like to come up to take the seminar class, this is a one week class. You're gonna take the five days with me, Monday through Friday, and you'll carve any one of these animals that you'd like. The tack that's on the animal is completely up to you to design on the blocks of wood. Uh, we're gonna show you how we create all of that tonight as well. Uh, but you can see here on the back of this magazine, this is Denzel's rabbit on the back. So you can, there's plenty of designs and pictures that you can go through and see the different horses and the tack that they all had on. Some of them were armored horses. The jeweled horses are usually the outer row standers, which means that all four feet are on the ground. The prancers will have their front feet or one or both front feet up. And then the jumpers all have all their feet off the ground and they're usually the ones who go up and down. So that's how they designate those. Uh, most carousel horses or animals who are on the outer row are your jeweled ones. They have a parade side, which is the side that faces the audience. They have all the animals' heads are usually turned out so that they look at the audience as they're going around and it goes around in a clockwise format. If you're a circus aficionado, when you get married, you get to ride on the carousel with your husband uh, after you get your ceremonies done. And if you want a divorce and you're a circus person, you go, go back on the carousel and you ride it in reverse, three times around. So that's how they do their divorces. Um, so what I got was the, the kits, but I got no patterns. So I cut out, I took the individual blocks, this is a horse's leg, but I took the individual blocks and I did the, the bodies and the heads, the legs, the feet, and the tail, all those pieces are separate because of the way the grain has to go on them so there's no breakage. Each one of these has a hole in it, and this hole holds a quarter inch dowel rod, like a little piece of dowel goes in here. Uh, so I made the patterns, and what we do is, on the big blocks like this, we have to have a, a thicker block for the body. We'll lay the blocks on, we'll lay the body on. We want the grain going across the body so that we can keep that on there. And then we'll trace around that. I use a, mar a permanent marker because it stays, and I found that if I use pencil, I have a tendency to rub it off with my hand. Uh, I use bass on these because it's readily available and it's fairly inexpensive to use. On um, the thinner pieces, like with the legs, we just lay the patterns on. Again, we want to make sure that the grain's going the right way. And each one of them has notches on them, as you can see, the little notch on here. This is where the pegs go. So just like when you're making and cutting out dress patterns, they have a, a tick out, a little diamond out. These have a notch on them. So when you draw this on here, you want to make sure that you put those notches on there so you know where you're going to be piecing in that dowel once you get these all cut out. And I will cover this whole board with parts and pieces. I will label them and then mark every one of the tick marks as I go along. So this is left rear and that's a cat. So then we'll mark each one of these as we go and we may have three left rears, three right rears, three front left, three front rights, and do a whole set of them for three different sets so that when I have to have enough to go to a class, I wanna make sure that I also have extras so that if they carve a horse but they decide, oh, I gotta do the bunny for my granddaughter or my cousin or somebody for a gift, they can come and buy a kit afterwards and it's basically the same process that they did for the horse, it's just a different type of animal. So that's how we start out with one of these and then we'll take this on the jigsaw and cut out all of these or on the um, 
scroll saw and take out all these little pe parts and pieces and I throw them all into a box and once the once all these are all cut out and then I take the box in and then we'll drill all of these I'll mark all these holes um, with a mark with the ruler and mark all these for their center where this hole has to go but that's why the ticks are on here so I know where it's going to line up at in the center of these pieces um, when I'm carving these uh, pieces I found the when I found the horses this is a briar horse it's a plastic uh, Will Shriver American saddlebred horse um, I found that the legs on here are the exact dimensions on this horse so it was real easy for me to take my calipers and measure everything so when I get the rough out done and I know where it's a basic shape and it's rounded over, I can go back in and do the details and make sure that the knee is exactly the same width on both front legs, the pasterns and everything's the same length, the same width, and then it makes it more professional looking, it's a more even carving, and calipers are a wonderful thing to have for when you're doing a four-legged animal because you don't want one leg fatter than the other, it just looks like there's something wrong with the horse. The first thing we're going to do is draw our center line down this piece. And this just keeps us orientated to the middle of the wood. We're going to know how much we're going to take off on each side. And once we get that done, I'm going to go back over it with my marker just to make sure that it is dark enough for me to see it and it doesn't get rubbed off. It'll eventually get carved off or sanded off when I get to the piece where, where I'm far enough along on the piece I can take it off. But even though it's going to be painted once it's done, we know I don't leave any of these blank in raw wood. I like them painted. Okay, we've got our center line drawn. From there, we're going to start adding our details. We're going to take our horse and we're going to measure up and see how much of a foot we've got here. And then we just transfer that information onto our block. So once we mark that, we can just come across and drop that down. Then we're going to come across the front of the foot. And again, the back heel of a horse's foot is not as high as the toe is on the front of the foot. So we want to get up just a bit of an ankle on it, like so. And then we're going to come up and put our first joint in where the ankle goes. And then we're going to come up and mark that or our hock coming in on both sides. So that's pretty much all I put on there when I start my legs on my horse. I use a, a hog burr, real aggressive cut saw, or uh, either one, I just like these because I can take a lot of wood off with it right away. When you start carving um, and you're doing a, from a block piece like this, you wanna remove a lot of wood real quickly so we want to use a, a more aggressive burr to get down and get the shape basically put in. Um, I like the rougher ones and then I have a, a series of coarser ones I, I, or smoother ones that we'll go through and we'll get down to the finer ones. When we get down to the very end, we'll end up with diamonds and then sanding cones or discs to be able to put the final touches on it and get it smooth. Um, the cat and the rabbit both are furred and all of the hair has been wood burned in underneath the paint job where the horses are smooth, so they require meticulous sanding in order to get them as smooth as possible so that their coats are just as glistening as, the, as if the horse was alive. Um, the manes and the tails, we want to add the details to of the hair. Um, the biggest thing that uh, I see with a lot of the carousels that are done now is that they do not have motion to the hair. There's no curvature in the carving. It's all just straight because it's easier to carve it straight than try to put a curve into it. So that's the difference between a new carving of a horse and an old carving of a carousel horse is that the main hair or the tail are straight. Um, they used to use live ho or, or, or original horse hair on them. Uh, you can still buy horse hair and I'm working on making a horse hair tail because um, I have to have some bundles of horse hair. Uh, but I haven't perfected yet, that yet, but the, one, the next two I'm going to do will both have live tails on them. So let's get started on this. I'm going to go in and we're going to take down these edges. I like to take the corners off first to give myself somewhat of a rounder surface to work from. I'm also watching the bottom of the foot to see where I'm at as far as roundness goes. Even though I know this foot is much too large for what I'm going to need, 
You can also come down here, take the horse, lay it down, and then put the foot up against it like so, and then trace around it so that you get a more accurate foot size on here. And that's going to give you a better representation. And I'm going to go ahead and put the frog in as well because I will carve that in there. Um, there's not quite enough wood on these uh, blocks to carve a shoe on. So what I've done is uh, I have used on the black and the bay horse, I've used silver paint to add the look of a shoe on there. A lot of the carvers, original carvers, would carve the shoes on the horse. This just, we just don't have that on this pattern. I could probably redraw it and recut it, but this is what I started with, was no shoes on. So we just paint them on, make them look like that. You can put them on as a flat shoe here, but they had um, spikes on the back end of them, maybe spikes on the tip, or war horses always had the spikes on them so they would have more sure footing on them. I'm going to change this out. We're going to put an inverted cone in. It has a flare like this. That There's no cutting surface of the tip. Um, it gives you a nice edge when you're separating out uh, the feet from the ankles and from the uh, pastern, which is the, distance, the difference between the ankle here and the foot. I go through a lot of burrs that I'm carving, power carving. I change them out and they may only last me a few minutes. And when I'm doing a whole horse, I will carve all of the legs at once. Um, I find that I've saved the body and the head, the bigger pieces for last because I want to make sure that the legs are proper and correct. I will carve these to the point where I am just about to finish sand. I will dry fit them on the body and make sure that they are lined up where they have to go. Um, on these, I will write on the back on the back side where it connects to the body, whether it's left or right, front or back, or, uh, foot on here, so that when I attach it to the horse, I'm going to know where it's going to go. And when I do dry fit these, I will go ahead and carve into the bodies as well before I start doing the final sand, before I even glue them on. It's much easier, I found, after the second horse, that if you do all the major carving first and get the, most of the sanding done, you got a lot less work trying to get in there when the legs are together and on there. So work as much as you can loose, but before you get ready to glue them on, then dry fit them and make sure everything lines up and it's on there. So when you go to glue this on your horse, you're going to have very little gap and you'll have very little putting to do to fill in any gaps that you do have. Now I know that the ankle is going to come in, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to carve down and I'm going to leave about a quarter of an inch of, of fat around this part for the ankle. So I'm just going to clean off a lot of this excess wood, working up to my center lines, both front and back. And you can see we're starting to get the shape in, where the foot and the ankle are starting to separate out. There's a long ways to go to get this down to where it needs to be, but you get the general idea is that you can separate these areas out really quickly, and with the power tools, you can carve it out fairly quickly as well. Um, by, these horses are very accurate, and that's one of the reasons I love working with these as my models. They're, they pay particular attention to the muscular structure of the horse and putting in all these separate little area muscle groups that are in these legs. You can transfer all that information onto these wood blocks. Most carousel horses were not quite this elaborate in the legs. Um, the heads and the manes and the tails were the main features, along with the tack. Um, a lot like this rose horse here on the front, all the flowers were carved separately or, or, or as part of the design. Uh, I'm going to make them out of uh, quick wood, which is a epoxy resin that you mix together with your hands, and it's sculptable for about 15 minutes. And so I'm, when I putty my horses, I always have extra left over. So rather than just throw it away as a little ball, I make a little rose out of it, and I let it and set it up on my workbench, and it dries. So I have a collection of these little roses. So when I get to the point where I'm ready to make my rose horse, all my roses will be done. And all I'll do is I'll grind the backs off a little bit flatter so that when I glue them on the horse, they'll go right into a little pocket that I'm going to reset them into. When we do the tack, um, we draw all of that on the body of the animal uh, when we start out with the block. 
And from there, you can design any kind of tack you want. Um, the horse on the very end, the black with the gold and the green, has the mane in that particular cut. Uh, the, like the rabbit has his ears in a cut. Uh, the, the bay horse has the flopped over horse uh, mane. And then the armored horse is braided down. So each individual animal you can design with the block of wood that comes with your kit. Uh, you can design armor on them. You can design very simple things. You can put a theme on them. We've seen them in um, American Red, White, and Blue with a, with a big flag across, draped across the breastplate. Um, the saddles can be very simple to very ornate. Uh, some of the saddles are actually jeweled uh, quite elaborately by certain companies, so it depends on what you're looking for. Um, I have hundreds of pictures that I've taken of carousels as I've traveled around. I stop and go, oh, there's one. You gotta pull over, I gotta take pictures. And sometimes I only find one or two animals on there that I actually like or that, are, uh, that I would suit my design aesthetics. And I like the bling on them, so they gotta be fancy. Um, you can always take a really nice designed or, or well-carved horse and make it more elaborate. So study pictures are always a great idea. I have probably 300 pictures right now in my collection for horses. Some of them are from um, fantasy games that are online that artists have created, and you can take some of their designs and work. Um, I have one that has, actually I've got it laid out to do a dragon head that goes over the horse's tail and the tail comes out of his mouth and it's braided down like the red horse so that it looks like the tongue of the dragon coming out of his mouth. I thought that was a really neat idea and so I'm going to take and I'm going to, I want to carve that into one of my horses that I'm going to carve. Just because I did these guys doesn't mean I'm going to stop now. Now it's kind of like you, I got addicted because there's no real limit to what you can't do with them and the things you want to design with them. I have a couple of pictures of seahorses and see creatures that they've done with the rope tails on them. Um, I've seen elephants and bears and lions and so there are a lot of other animals that I can take the basic body of and go ahead and work that in. Now if you start with this base shape and know how much wood that you have to play with on your saddle, the back of your saddle, some of them have the real high backs on them, depending on what you need you can augment this simple body pattern so that when you get ready to go, you know, your head's gonna go on here and it's gonna fit correctly because it's made to fit on here. So if you start with a body and all you're doing is augmenting the saddle part or maybe the breastplate that you want to build it out to carve the roses on it, if you're a car better carver on the roses, I've tried, I'm not real good at carving the flowers, but I can make them out of, sculpt them out of clay real quick. So to me, that's, and they're not as fragile. Uh, they may look more delicate, but they're actually hard, harder than the wood that's on, that they're on. Um, I use wood glue the, for the type two tight bond. It doesn't have to be outdoor, the type three. Uh, it holds stronger than anything else around it. Um, I have done some super glue, but I don't particularly care for it. It has a tendency to whiten things. It doesn't always take paint the, the best. Um, well, these are wood glued, and then we putty them in with the uh, quick wood, which is, like I said, it's an epoxy resin. It comes in a tube. You can buy it at most of your hardware stores. Um, once they're done, and all that is sanded down, uh, a lot of the horses have glass eyes. Uh, some of them have, uh, one of them has carved eyes on it. I like the glass eyes. You could buy them in different colors. Um, these are six millimeter eyes on these horses. And so I have them in brown and I have them in black and then I have a set of blue ones for different animals that I'm gonna do later. Um, the jewels, I can pick up uh, almost any place, but you can buy them in little packages and they come from two millimeter up to 10 millimeters. So you have an assortment of sizes. You can buy them in multicolors or you can buy them in an individual color. When I paint the horses, uh, I spray paint them first. I like the evenness that I get from spray paint. It gives me a nice base coat. The rabbit and the cat were both based in white first. They're spray painted white. I get a nice thin film on them. Um, it takes me about a day to paint the cat and any of the horses, a full day of paint. Um, the cat and the rabbit were done in multiple layers like we do with our birds so that you're not using just pure white. It's got a little bit of warm white in it. It's got a little bit of a gray mix to it. It's got a little bit of a blue and a little bit of yellow mix to it so that you get this multiple layer effect. With a cat, 
we worked on the different grays and the darker areas of the blacks so we could get this multicolor effect so that it looked more like a blending of fur on the animal and not just stripes on it that were just blobbed on. Um, the silver and red horse actually has silver leaf on it. Uh, and the gold one has gold leaf on it. There's also copper leaf and there's variegated leaves. That's done with an adhesive base on it called size. It's a white liquid and you put it on with a, a small throwaway brush and then let it dry and it comes out white and dries clear. I usually use two coats so it gets extra sticky oh, yeah. to hold up better so when you put the foil on it'll actually stick better. Um, you want to wear gloves like uh, rubber gloves, not thick ones but the hospital gloves when you're handling any kind of leaf because your hands will tarnish it. Even on the gold, it will tarnish. It's very easy to tear it. It's thinner than even tissue paper. It's very, very fine. So you lay it on your, your pieces and then you use a, like a blush brush, very soft brush, and you just tap on it to push it onto the epoxy or onto the glue so that it holds it down. Now some of them will get a little bit of cracking and crazy in it because it's going in and out of all these little dents that we've carved in for all the jewels, but that's okay. You're always going to have what's called shill afterwards and that's the excess that comes off of there. You could just pat patch that back on. You just pick up little pieces and just pound those into where you're missing spots and it'll stick right in there. So that's real easy to, it's, some people think it's difficult to work with, but we're not laying it down as smooth sheets. We're laying it onto carved areas we can patch what we need to patch. And once that's done, then you can go ahead and glue your jewels all on. I use E6000 and I put it into a syringe with a, a plastic tip on it so that I can squeeze it out and I can control exactly how much I'm doing. I usually do just four jewels at a time and then I have um, pick them up with tweezers and lay them individually into their little divots. Each one of them has a little divot so it'll stick better into that glue and there's, it may come up with just a little bit on each side so it holds it in better. I've used it for decades on gourds and being a curved surface on a gourd, you can't just lay a jewel, even if it's flat back, on there. It has to have a recessed area to go into and using these 6,000, I've had pieces for on the road, out in shows and nothing's ever fallen off. So the E6000 is the glue to use. It has enough elasticity in it that it will actually move and flex with the weather and the different temperatures that you're going into. Um, it has a great bonding material with different kinds of elements, like with the jewels onto the wood. Uh, it holds real well, um, so I'm real happy with that. Is on the, on the side of the red and black horse, there's a larger gemstones in there, there's a mirror back gemstones. I traced those out on this plank of this horse. This was traced out on here so that I could carve a recess and I dry fitted each one of them in on both sides to make sure that they fit exactly where they were supposed to go before I put the foil in so that they would set right in where they had to go and make sure that they'll fit right every time. And that's part of um, getting a little gauge that you can get and making sure that, okay, that checking your, the size of your tips that you use to your little ball burrs. You can check which size they are and see what kind of a divot it makes. If you don't want to, you don't want to use say, okay, well that's a, a five millimeter ball. Well, it may be a five millimeter, but you're not going to push it deep enough in there to make the whole five millimeters. So on a scrap piece of wood or on the bottom of your base, you can just hit it in there and push it down in, see how far it makes and then measure it. So it might only be three. So you go, oh, okay, I can use this one for a three millimeter and I can get three millimeter beads in every one of these holes. So you can actually I'd mark them on here, make a little hash marks on here with a marker and make like three bands and know that that's a three millimeter. And you can buy them in different sizes. Like this one will probably make more like an eight millimeter hole in it. So depending on what size you want to use, you can gauge them out so that each one of your little divots has that spot in it that it's going to go into and then they'll hold on better. Um, 